Why do good people suffer? How can we keep our faith when everything falls apart? The Old Testament book of Job tells the story of a good man who loses his family, his wealth, and even his health. And his friends do their best to comfort him, but they only make things worse. They're mistakenly convinced that Job's suffering must be linked to some kind of moral failure. Now, there's no consensus among scholars around when the book was written, who wrote it, its origins of where it was written, or who the original audience were. It's written in the style of wisdom literature, distinctly Israelite in its theology, and yet universal in its application to the human condition. It is in many ways timeless. The book is a great work of dramatic irony. In the opening chapter, the reader is introduced to something that the characters don't know. First, we meet Job, who is described as blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Now, this will later be questioned by his friends, but the author wants us to know of Job's virtuous character. This description relates to how the book of Proverbs defines one who is wise. Job has great wealth, a vast collection of livestock and servants. He's got seven sons and three daughters, numbers that signify completeness and perfection. He lives in Uz, a place that's difficult to locate but was east of Israel. We're told that as a family they would feast together and that Job would make burnt offerings on behalf of his children in case they had any sin in their hearts. Job's life is one of ritual purity and despite his great wealth, his desire is to please God. The reader is then taken to a celestial courtroom. The Lord draws Satan's attention to Job. Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan literally means the accuser. And Satan brings his accusation. Surely Job only fears God because all that God has blessed him with. And so permission is granted to test the genuineness of Job's faith, but not to lay a finger on the man himself. And four disasters follow, destroying his animals, his servants, and children. The human causes of Job's suffering come from the attack first of the Sabaeans and then the raids of the Chaldeans. And the natural causes include fire and wind. And Job's response is to fall to the ground and worship. We're then back in the heavenly courtroom where we're presented with Job's integrity as being upstanding despite the disasters that have been afflicted in front of him. And so Satan asks for permission to further test Job's faith and permission is given to afflict Job but not to take his life. Job is then covered with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And yet, Job still maintains his integrity. His wife suggests that he should curse God and die, advice that Job dismisses as being foolish. And then his friends come to comfort him. And at first they sit with him for seven days and seven nights, not saying a word. And although their support started well, they soon add insult to Job's agony when they begin to speak. And despite their insensitivity, Job continues to remain faithful to God. And then in chapter 19, we come to one of the most famous passages in the book of Job, featuring in Handel's Messiah. Now, the Hebrew text of Job is often quite difficult to translate. And rather than modifying it to grammatically make sense of the difficult passages, Jewish scribes preserved it as they found it when they made copies. 
Older translations saw this passage as predicting the Christian doctrine of resurrection. And although accurately understanding this passage may not lead us to that conclusion, the truth of these verses are just as powerful. Despite his physical and his mental torment, Job affirms that justice will be done, that his defense counsel is living and will rise to plead his cause, and that God will be on his side. In verse 23, Job states, Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. He wants a written record of his case, that his innocence would be declared. And more than that, he wants a public record, not hidden in a book, but carved on a monument. Oh, that with an iron pen and with lead, they were engraved on a rock forever. Job's confidence in finding justice is not placed in his own words or in the record of his conduct, but in another. He continues, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. The word for Redeemer here is sometimes referred to as a kinsman redeemer. It was a next of kin who would intervene in a situation to preserve family rights. It included redeeming property and even people. In the story of Ruth, it involved marrying a widow to give her deceased husband an heir. It's the background to this this argument that's put forward by the Sadducees concerning the resurrection. The word is also used by the covenant people to refer to Yahweh, their covenant God. As God commissioned Moses, he said, I am the Lord and I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Who is the Redeemer that Job expects to rise to defend his case? It's none other than the Lord God. In the next verses we read, And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold and not another. Job has a confidence that his Redeemer will vindicate him even after death. Notice there the repetition on seeing and the emphasis on what his eyes will behold. Job is looking by faith to that which is unseen. His Redeemer, at the last, will stand upon the earth. And the word for stand in the original Hebrew and in the Greek translations means to arise. In Job's expectation, he is looking for heavenly justice. In the readers of Jesus' day, it would have clearly suggested to them the resurrection. Because Jesus is alive, everything changes. Jesus died in our place. And when we put our trust in Jesus, we are in Christ. That means that when God looks at us, we are declared sinless, for we are in Christ. He is our Redeemer. God promises that all who put their trust in Jesus will rise also. And so we can look forward to a day when, like Job, we too will behold him, when we will see our Redeemer. Towards the conclusion of the book, Job questions God and then receives a powerful response from the Lord in a series of of poetic lessons that set out the sovereignty of God and Job's need to fully trust in the Lord. Job is then restored to health, happiness and even prosperity beyond all that he had before. In his suffering, Job kept his faith in God. As disciples of Jesus, We are to live by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, 
the conviction of things not seen. Our faith in what God has done and will do. We have an assurance that God's word, that all in God's word that is promised, will come to pass. Faith is both about looking to the future, the things hoped for, and also looking to the past, the things not seen. We may not have witnessed events in God's story firsthand, but we still believe them to be true. Many people may have faith in something. Or even their faith in their own ability to change their circumstances. But it's often little more than a vague hope or wish that things will turn out right. What makes the Christian faith powerful is not our own feelings or experience, but the object of our faith. The God who was and is and evermore shall be. You could have utter faith that a small, single-engined plane will take you across the Atlantic, but it would be misplaced. But even the most nervous flyer will get on a 747 because they know that it will cross the ocean. A tiny amount of faith placed in the right object will give us confidence in the way that we live, the decisions that we make. In Hebrews 11, the chapter continues to chart the various people across the story of the Old Testament who lived by faith. Living by faith leads to obedience, even when the world around us does not make sense. Living by faith means that we act with justice, that we love kindness, that we walk humbly with God. Living by faith means that we will endure suffering as we know that we will inherit the kingdom of God. When the world around us seems gloomy, may we shine like stars as we live by faith. May we declare as Job did, for I know that my Redeemer lives and at the last he will stand upon the earth. Amen. Amen.